Hello, my name is Robert Goodwin, and this is Law on the Line. I would like to welcome Stephanie Brown as a guest and uh, for, this, uh, for this particular show, and uh, welcome aboard, Stephanie. Thank you so much for having me. And Stephanie is a uh, licensed uh, social worker and is the uh, executive director uh, for CASA, C-A-S-A, -S -A, which is Court Appointed Special Advocate. And we're going to spend the next 30 minutes or so learning about CASA and its important role in the court system and advocating and representing as non-attorneys our children. So, Stephanie, uh, you are a, a clinical, you are a licensed social worker and you've been with CASA for about Eight I've been years? with CASA for eight years, and then I was with uh, two other CASA programs for four years before that. And was that all in uh, the state of New Jersey or in other in states New as Jer well? In New Jersey and in Texas, actually. So CASA is throughout the United States? Yes, CASA is national. There are about uh, 1,000 CASA programs across the United States, and so most counties are covered by a CASA program. So he yeah, go ahead. Here so, in Middlesex County, it's a CASA program that just covers the county of Middlesex. There are other CASA programs in the state covering multiple counties. So what does CASA, what is it and what does it do? Thanks. So we advocate for kids that have been abused or neglected and removed from their home. So we only work with kids who have been removed from their home. And as staff, we recruit, screen, train, and supervise volunteer advocates that are actually responsible for doing the work of CASA. So the volunteer advocates, once they're trained, they get appointed to work with a specified child or sibling group that's living in foster care. And they end up advocating on behalf of their needs while they're going through the foster care system. So question, who removes children from home? Homes, and um, how does CASA integrate its services with the court? Oh, great question. So usually DCPNP, the Division of Child Protection and Permanency, formerly known as DIFUS, will remove children um, on an emergency basis because there's some reason that the children cannot be safely in their homes at that moment. Um, but immediately after that, the case goes to what is called a Dodd hearing, and that's where the judge determines if that removal was indeed necessary. And from there, then the parents will get representation, and then they have the opportunity to come back um, and further discuss the allegations. So this is before a Superior Court judge and at what point after the Dodd hearing which when which a judge makes the ruling early on that the children children are properly removed from the home when and how does CASA get involved or CASA get involved? So our, and for our CASA program, it's different for various CASA programs, but in Middlesex County, our, uh, one of our staff members goes to the Dodd hearing, so they're actually able to hear what's happening um, right as the kids have been removed and are being placed into that foster home. And when I say foster home, by the way, I don't necessarily mean um, a hired home. It can also be, uh, it could be all types of facilities. It could be a children's shelter. It could be a relative's home. It could be a juvenile detention facility. I just mean kids that have been removed from their family of origin. Um, so we usually have someone go to that Dodd hearing, and then they let the judge know if we have an advocate available to be assigned to that case. And what the judge does is they um, sign an appointment order that says this specific advocate is being assigned to work with these specific children. And the, um, the appointment order is pretty involved. It gives the CASA advocate the opportunity to uh, gather any kind of information about the child that they might need to. They're actually able to um, gather information that's educational and uh, health-related information that would be typically protected by, you know, FERPA or, or HIPAA. So you're talking about non-attorneys who, or maybe someone who was a volunteer, may have been an attorney mm -hmm. or could perhaps even actively practice in another area of the law. Number one, how do they, how do you become a, a CASA volunteer? And, um, and then where does the, how is the training um, uh, given? 
So first of all, you hit on the fact that we have all different kinds of people that are CASA advocates, which is an important note to make because you don't have to have a specific background, although we do have some that are attorneys or um, retired social workers, retired teachers. Um, so CASA advocates come from all walks of life and they get trained through a pretty extensive um, training process. So they actually are screened first, they have an interview, they have background checks. And this is done they, by whom? By the staff members of CASA. And how many so, staff members do you have? In so we have six staff members. It's a relatively small staff. We have over a hundred volunteer advocates. Oh, okay. So and go ahead. They're committing 10 to 15 hours each month of volunteer time, uh, those, those advocates are, uh, to make sure that kids' best interests are, are met. So it's relatively uh, little staff time compared to all the work that the volunteers are doing. So there, a, a volunteer is assigned to a particular case. Mm -hmm. And that's after that volunteer has been trained. Mm -hmm. Just describe briefly for our audience how, what the training consists of. Sure. It's a 35-hour training, and we're actually holding our fall training now. We hold it three times a year, and so the next one will we'll start in February for folks who might be interested. Is this virtual or is this in person? It's both. Okay. It's, we have in-person sessions once a week and then virtual homework in between those sessions that make up the 35 hours. And, and these are held in your office? It's actually held in Sayreville at the Fire Academy. Oh, okay. So they've got a nice venue there for us. And they have nice classrooms there. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been there before. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So our training actually covers everything from how the family court system works, the history of child welfare, um, cultural competency and humility, to how to work with families uh, dealing with specific issues like poverty, substance abuse, mental illness, uh, domestic violence, et cetera. That's a comprehensive uh, array of, of topics that you cover. It is, and there's no possible way for us to be able to cover everything that might come up on a case in 35 hours. A lot of these subjects could be their own you know, college course. So we provide each advocate also with what's called a peer coach after they uh, finish their training class. And that peer coach is responsible for providing them you know, supervision and guidance while they're working on their case. So once, how is the selection process for a coach or not a, a coach, a, an advocate um, made in terms of assigning it to a particular child? How, how does that work? You... Oh, that's, that's a great question. It's, it's a little bit science and a little bit art. <laughs> okay. Um, so it depends on what cases have come in. And we always need, we're always in need of more Spanish speaking volunteers and more bilingual volunteers. And so folks who are bilingual, obviously they're gonna get matched to a case that has that specific language need. Um, but we also have situations where someone might have special expertise or background in a certain age group, or maybe with kids who are autistic or kids who are facing substance abuse issues or whatever it might be that they have a background in, we will try and match them to a case where their special knowledge will be utilized. Not everyone has that kind of special knowledge, but sometimes um, a child might be more comfortable working with a male or working with a female, or maybe they're comfortable with someone who's a little closer to them in age, et cetera. And so we also try to utilize, um, you know, we look at the needs of the child and the wants of the child as we make that match. And are there age requirements for volunteers or minimum and maximum ages or open to all, I assume, over the age of 18 no. to? <laughs> right. It's actually the age of 21. 21. And, and it's no maximum age. Okay. We love good. working with people of all ages. Now, the children who are um, a part of the program, where does the CASA volunteer meet them and, um, and how many times does a volunteer meet with the family or the child in particular? Just go into that a little bit further so hopefully we can recruit some volunteers from our yes. general listening public <laughs> and who would like to participate in this really worthwhile program. Give us a little idea about what a CASA volunteer does in the mm -hmm. course of the month or two that they may be with a family. And I'm speculating that it could even be longer. Yes. So on average, our cases actually last for about 18 months. 
So it's, it's quite a process. Yeah, it is a process. And we get to know the kids very well. So the advocate is responsible for visiting with the kids at least once a month. And then they also talk to teachers, um, health professionals, therapists, biological parents, foster parents, caseworkers, anyone who has an important perspective on the needs of the child. And they gather all that information together and put it into a court report. A these court cases, report. yes, these cases go in front of the judge every two to three months. And so they'll, they'll compile a report that paints a picture of what's going on in the child's life for the judge and present that to the court at every hearing. And it's actually taken into evidence. It's taken very seriously. The judges um, actually accept the vast majority of our recommendations, over 95% of them. And, uh, and, and they read through all of the recommendations and the report and they ensure that everything that we've put in there is being addressed. So that's the, the responsibility of the CASA advocate. And you know, just so perhaps we don't scare away potential uh, volunteers, is it a lengthy report? Are there formats um, uh, that, that are followed or uh, something where a volunteer can say, oh, I'm overwhelmed. I, this is uh, like writing a term paper for college. Uh, is there assistance offered to the volunteers so they, the report is done uh, without too much um, um, uh, anxiety? Mm -hmm. It's, it's definitely a, a point of anxiety for new volunteers, but we help to coach them through that. So the report is only two to three pages. Oh, okay. And it's really meant um, to, to describe what's going on in the child's life. And there is a lot of training in that 35-hour training class related to how that report looks. Um, trainees even write a sample report. And then when they are working on a case of their own, we have their peer coach available to review their court report before it's actually submitted to the court. So there are a lot of supports in place. Now, at what point is the report submitted to the judge? Is this at the point in time when a judge has to make a determination as to perhaps uh, make a finding of abuse and neglect or, 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 or something, or at what point? Mm -hmm. So we're not responsible for researching whether or not the abuse or neglect occurred. That's left up to DCPNP. But as there are ongoing issues on the case, we bring those forward to the judge. So a lot of times the kids will have needs in between these hearings, and that's why they're heard every two to three months, because things come up for the kids. Um, maybe the child was moved from one placement to another, but we're trying to make sure that they at least can stay in the school, that they're, you know, their school of origin, where they're doing really well, getting good grades, succeeding. Um, maybe they haven't seen a sibling of theirs who got placed in a different placement for two months. Well, we're gonna bring that up and say, this child wants to see their sibling, let's make it happen. Uh, maybe they're, they have been involved in ballet or soccer, or some kind of extracurricular, and they want to get engaged in that again. We're going to bring that up at the hearings. So it's advocating for all of those things that a concerned parent would be looking at. But in this case, unfortunately, there's not a concerned parent available to perform that role for the kids. And how many, are there interim reports, in other words, or is there only one final report? It seems like you're going back to court every few months, mm -hmm. and are the, each time you go back, there is an interim report mm -hmm. showing the child's progress or children's progress? Yes, and toward the end of a case, we will make recommendations for, um, in that report, about where the child might live permanently. And so there have been times even where we're recommending maybe a relative that no one else has identified in the case. And, and sometimes we make, you know, we make um, recommendations in a child's case that might really change the course of their life. So we are making recommendations all throughout the case related to um, any aspect that impacts their well-being, but we are also making recommendations about the, the final outcome of their case. And how does CASA, at, during the course of this process, which is before the court in a, uh, I guess we call that the FN court, the, the uh, part of the family division. Yeah, it's called Children in Court is the particular docket, and it is an FN case, um, which can an become FC. an FG or an FC. It may, may become that, mm -hmm. but how does CASA interact with the, uh, the attorney that's appointed or the GAL 
um, for the for the child, the guardian ad litem. Mm -hmm. We work closely with them. They unfortunately have very, very large caseloads and can't always spend as much time uh, getting to know the kids as, as our CASA advocates are able to since they're working with just the one child or sibling group. Um, and so a lot of the law guardians will rely on the CASA report um, to make some of their recommendations and rely on the relationship that the CASA advocate has built with the child um, and the information that they've been able to gather. And the attorney, the office of the attorney general uh, represents DCP and P. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I know sometimes uh, it's an and it's an adversarial proceeding between DCP and P, and perhaps the and the attorneys that represent the parents. And what role does Casa have with respect to the parent or parents who have temporarily and maybe permanently? lost custody of their child. So it's one of the important jobs of the CASA advocate is to talk to the parents because we need to gather information about how they're doing, what they're learning, how they're setting their home up, hopefully for reunification mm -hmm. for the kids. Um, so that is one of the important jobs of the CASA advocate. Um, but certainly there are times where there is, like you said, an adversarial type situation. Sometimes we're saying this child isn't safe to go home when the parents want the child home. Um, and and so parents have an become, attorney perhaps representing them. Right, it can become a challenge. And we do visit with, um, with the parents and with their attorneys. And we try and let them know where our perspective uh, you know what our perspective is and and why that's our perspective and our, our perspective is based solely on the best interest of the child and we bring that information to them before the hearing so that we're not like surprising each other right. with new information or trying to um, you know make anyone's life difficult we just want to make sure that what the child really needs is being represented in, in court and is the attorney office of the attorney general advocating for the uh, for the uh, division, um, are you? Uh, how do how do you folks relate to one another? Is that adversarial at times, or um, which I guess it could be? Uh, how does that work? It could be. Most of the time, we work closely together. Again, because. Um because DCPMP caseworkers have such large caseloads. I actually spent some time as a caseworker before working for CASA oh. and remember the experience of feeling like I was kind of always putting out fires. I had so many cases um, and didn't have the opportunity to build the relationship with the kids and the family that I wanted to. And so I know caseworkers are spread very thin. And as a result, we sometimes are able to work um, really well with the caseworkers and do things that they might not have time for. An example is educational meetings. We tend to be very involved in the educational meetings for the child because we're not necessarily only advocating in court. We also do advocacy in other settings like the school. So we've had situations where a child um, had an IEP, but their um, individual education plan. Right. And, and so that's for a child who has special education needs. And we've had a situation where they were supposed to be, you know, getting extra time on test. They were allowed to have fidget toys in their classroom. They, you know, they had all these different exceptions, but they were they were written on paper, but not actually happening in the classroom. And because there's not a concerned parent there to be the squeaky wheel and say, my child needs this, this, and this, it could just fall through the cracks. Um, and the caseworker is not able to go to all those meetings because they're in court. They're out. Um, setting up visits with parents, et cetera. In a large so, caseload. And have a huge caseload. And so a lot of times the CASA advocate is, um, you know, sort of in the role of that, the parent there. And, and they're at the meeting and they're asking the right questions and they're pushing the right buttons to make sure that the plan is right and that the things in the plan are actually occurring. And so a lot of times the caseworkers are really grateful to have a CASA advocate on the case um, working with them and supplementing some of the things that they just don't have the bandwidth for. So is each case that's before uh, the court uh, in which um, DCPMP is involved uh, having to do with a child or children being re having been removed from their parents' residence or their parents, does each case have a CASA representative? 
not every single one. You'll get a different answer from different counties because we're all separate nonprofit right. organizations. But for Casa of Middlesex County, right now we're serving 61% of those cases. And it is our goal to serve every child who needs a CASA advocate. And so, how, who makes that determination? Or how is that determination made? In other words, do you follow the docket or do you get a phone call from the judge? How, how does that work? So, the, so our listening audi audience understands how, we get, how CASA gets brought into a case. Mm -hmm. So we go to that initial Dodd hearing. Correct. And then after that hearing, um, we approach the judge and say, hey, this looks like it's a case that could use a CASA. And here's the CASA advocate that we have to appoint to the case. And they always... 100% of the time say yes, please. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, that appointment order gets signed and they can start doing their work. And do judges get specific training or at least an introduction to CASA when they are assigned to the family court, the disillusion, uh, the uh, non-disillusion section having to do with kids, children in court? Not necessarily, um, but what we do is have, we set up meetings with new judges um, as CASA staff so that we can get to explain the role. And what we've found is that a lot of the CASA, um, or sorry, a lot of the judges have had such an exceptionally good experience with CASA that they kind of pass along to the next judge, hey, CASA is going to be an important resource for you. Um, and so at least in Middlesex County, that's been our experience, and we're very, very lucky to have great judges. Uh, we, in, in which we do. And so, and so there's coordination coordination uh, along many paths, including with the uh, guardian ad litem that's appointed to the case, which is, uh, you know, separately from CASA. Is, is that fair to say? Yes. So the guardian, uh, well, so the law guardian is well, typically sorry. what we call right, the, law um, guardian. That's correct. the attorney for the child. Their responsibility is to advocate for what the child wants. And so we find that a lot of times what the child wants um, might be in line with what's in their best interest, and sometimes it's yeah, not. Right. And so that's one of the important reasons that the that the CASA advocate is part of the case, is to bring to light things that might be important for the child that the child isn't necessarily, um, not always in, even in favor of. Now, importantly, CASA needs funds to keep going. Mm -hmm. Because you're a not-for-profit, private, not-for-profit agency, mm -hmm. correct? So to talk about that and what kind of support do you get from your funding sources and from the court, if anything, from the state? Mm -hmm. So we do get funds from the state. We also get funds from the federal government through Victims of Crime Assistance uh, Fund. We also run a lot of fundraisers. And folks can find out about upcoming fundraisers on our website. And We're can you give the our audience the benefit of your uh, website? Yes, casaofmiddlesexcounty.org. Okay, that's easy. All right. Um, or I can be contacted at stephanie at casaofmiddlesexcounty.org is, um, is my email address. Okay. So let's talk about funding sources again. Mm -hmm. What other, what you get money from or CASA gets support from? Right. So we also get some corporate donations. And so we're always looking for corporations in the area who might be interested in sponsoring an event or sponsoring, um, you know, sponsoring a child. It takes about $1,900 to support one CASA advocate working on a case um, with one child for a year. And so we're always looking um, at that number as kind of our basis for fundraising. And uh, we certainly will continue to operate fundraisers throughout the year and appeals throughout the year if folks want to get in touch about that. And at any current time, what is the caseload uh, here in Middlesex County uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for CASA? How many cases are you handling at any given time? So we have, last year we served 202 kids. And we're looking to increase that to about 300 in order to serve all of the kids that need a CASA advocate. And so we plan to do that over the next three years. That's our goal. Um, and it's, it's definitely within reach if we continue to spread the word about CASA and have folks um, applying to be CASA advocates. You know, in my notes, I'm just looking at, you know, can you share uh, an example of how CASA impacts a case. 
Yes. So what, what would be a, uh, well, give us the example that you were thinking of when you asked me to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many examples. Go ahead. Um, but one recent one was over the summer, we had a situation where a child, a uh, young boy who's severely disabled, was going to summer school and the school bus dropped him off outside of his house an hour early when no one was home and left. And so this is the kind of situation that a parent would normally address, but there was no one who was prepared to deal with this. And so you say dropped him hall off. dropped him off outside of his house, his but, guardian's house. Oh, his guardian's house. Okay. And no one. I'm um, sorry, I might have said parent, but um, but definitely guardian. And so there was no one home, um, and this child, this school age child with disabilities, was outside alone. So um, the casa advocate was contacting the school, trying to organize a better system. It ended up that the bus driver got retrained and they ended up putting a paraeducator on the bus to work one-on-one -on -one with that child and make sure that he's getting home safely and that he is safe on the bus. So why was not, did CASA investigate as to why uh, a, a guardian wasn't at home at that time? Was there a... It was, the bus driver dropped him off an hour early. Early, mm -hmm. an hour early. So that of course why. the parent, the guardian wasn't there. Right. That makes, so that's that makes an sense. example of CASA being the squeaky wheel in a situation where a child just fell through the cracks. Um, we also have right now a situation where a youth is, um, unfortunately, she's not going to be adopted. She's not going to reunify. She's going out in the world on her own. And our CASA advocate. Is she 18 or close to 18? Mm -hmm. And we have one more so, minute. So okay. we have to, go ahead. What happened? <laughs> so our CASA advocate is actually working closely with her to set up her house. So that's, that's kind of a fun, happy ending for yeah. them. Um, but they're sourcing uh, from all different kinds of resources that the CASA is aware of of different items for her house to make sure she's all set up with her dishes and her plates and everything. Now, does CASA get involved with children who are not in the system, so to speak? No. Okay, so every child is has a, a, a docket number and case assigned to it, so to speak, through the, through the court. Is yes. That, okay. Um, and what do you see the future of CASA to be as, as an integral part of our system? So we are working to, um, one, to uh, work with all the kids that need a CASA advocate, as I mentioned, within the next three years. And we're also working closely with the um, DCPNP and the child welfare system as we move toward ensuring that kids can be home. Um, foster care is really meant to be a very temporary solution and preferably kids are going to be with family members um, when they're in temporary care. And so we're working closely um, with DCP, PNP and with the courts to make sure that um, kids can be with family whenever possible. And how about the, uh, the attorneys who work very hard and I know representing uh, the interests of the children, are they all aware of what CASA does or and what about information to the general bar, who maybe does family law but doesn't get involved in the uh, abuse and neglect cases or the other children in court cases? Mm -hmm. So most of them are finding out through presentations that we make, um, individual connections. There's not uh, necessarily a particular system in place to inform them about CASA. Um, but as I mentioned, we work very closely with the law guardians, and so they become very familiar with us quickly. Well, thank you so much, and I am going to make sure that uh, we get you back on a seminar uh, for the uh, members of the family section of uh, Middlesex County Bar Association so we could spread the word and more people and more attorneys learn about CASA. Thank you so very much. And I thank you, Stephanie, for a, a very, very enlightening program. Wonderful to be here. Thank you.